Hey all, Andy here, helping you build a career you love today. More specifically, we're gonna help you get paid more. Happy Thursday, welcome to my live office hour show. If you're here with me live, great to have you. If you're watching me on the recording, great to have you too. I got a treat for you today. I, uh, I've never talked about the concepts of getting paid more this way ever. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to bring this to you. Uh, get in, get comfortable, say hi. I'd just like to say a quick hello before I dive in. Kim, how are you? Varun, uh, is it Dotho? Good to see you. T.A. Bragg, what's up? Michael Tay, always appreciate you watching me from uh, what well, is probably midnight your time now. Baby girl, Donna, Jason, Alec, Adam, Mohit, and everybody else. Okay, what's today all about? Well, I don't know if I titled this live show as accurately as as the topic is going to say, because I was talking about why the expected salary question that you get asked in a job interview, most likely a screen by a recruiter or an HR person, where they ask you, what's your expected salary? Or even, I would also throw in this bucket, even if you're looking at a job description and you see a budgeted salary or a salary range, on the job description, or anything that has anything to do with you having some kind of idea of what the job pays before you get started. And there is a superficial issue, there's an actual issue, and there's some things I want you to do and not do, but, but this talk today is going to be about understanding what transpires between the time you get into the initial interview and the time you actually negotiate your salary and what are the five or so things that actually change as a result of when between the time you start and the time you actually get a job offer. I want you to put these in the forefront of your mind because I think it will be easier for you to overcome the issue that you're facing immediately when you start, which is when you get asked what your expected salary. Now, I have a couple, three, actually, maybe four videos or so, might even be more, on my YouTube channel about how to address this question at the start. The recruiter asks you, what's your expected salary? My recommendation is that you be evasive and you say, you know, obviously salary is important, but there's so much more to it. At this moment, I'm not really informed as to everything you want me to do, what I'll get to do, who I get to do it with, and everything else that goes along with your value pack, your, your, your offer itself, right? There's a lot of things that contribute to this. Money's only one of them. And I give you scripted ways to respond to that. And I even talk with you in some videos about even if you have to give an expected salary, how you can actually overcome that and get paid more down the road. I don't want to spend really any time today talking about that because that's not the thrust of what I want to teach you. The, the question in and of itself even if the budgeted salary, even if the expected salary that you give, or even if the budgeted salary that the, that the recruiter or HR person provides is below what it is that you want to earn or what you're hoping to earn, my recommendation to you is if you like the organization and you want to work in the organization, in the organization, maybe not even that role, get in, say fine, and go. Because a lot happens between the time you start and the time you finish. And I want to break this down for you. And I want to be crystal clear. I want to pull a lot of things to the forefront of your mind that I do not think rarely anyone thinks about when they get into an interview process. Employers, they have essentially five variables once you start. And this, I want to pull these five to the forefront of your mind. Every organization has to start these two things. They have goals and they have problems. They have goals. I want to implement the system because it's going to help me generate more revenue. I'm going to implement this, this process because it's going to help me serve my customers better. And while that may be a how to accomplish a goal, the goal is ultimately raise money, decrease cost, make things faster, right? Dollars, cents, and customers. And no matter what their goals are, they have problems in achieving those goals. Now, the problems, I don't mean problems even in a negative way. We have challenges we need to overcome. That's why we hire people to solve these issues, to implement these systems so that we can do certain things or do them better than we were doing previously or implement new things that we've never done before. Goals and problems, those are first two things, right? I need, I have a goal, I have some challenges, and then I have an estimated solution in my mind 
of how that goal will be achieved, what's going to be the route in order for me to achieve that goal, and a picture of the person that it's going to take to solve that to solve that um, problem, to overcome those challenges, to achieve those goals by implementing the solution I think they're going to implement. I need somebody to implement this uh, piece of software. That sounds to me like it should be a person who's got a few years of experience programming in this language, blah, blah, blah. So, so now, the first thing, and I don't even want to go off the rails here, but most companies shouldn't even think this way. You don't think about solving problems in terms of bodies. You, you think about solving problems in terms of function satiation. What is it that I need handled so that I can attain that goal? It could be a person and a system. It could be a person and two systems. It could be two part-time people. There's many, many ways to the how to solve the problem or achieve the goal it can be skinned many ways, but most organizations are lazy. They hang on to what they're used to knowing and they just think in terms of people solving problems. That's the, these are the three and four. And then the fifth thing that they do is they have an assumption about the expense it's going to cost. So the person, the person who looks like this that can solve a problem this way to help me achieve the goal that I think I can attain basically costs a certain amount of money to achieve this solution. Okay, There are five things at play, none of which you know the moment you get into the first interview. So my rhetorical question for you is, why the hell would you answer what your expected salary should be if you don't know how these five things are gonna coexist and the change that's going to occur between the assumptions the employer has and what you're gonna help them understand is gonna happen if they hire you. Because all five of these things are at play. They're all going to change between the time you start and the time you finish the interviewing process if you have the luxury of doing so. Now, if you quit and bug out because you saw some information or got some information or heaven forbid made some assumption about what you thought they were gonna pay you based on what some recruiter told you they were gonna pay or what some job description advertised or Ugh, some glass door archaic review said they pay, you're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities. And the other thing it says that you're telling yourself is you don't have faith in your ability to convince them of how well you'll do all of these things. So the first thing that I want you to understand is there are five things at play. The second thing is they can all change. And what you want to do between the time you start and the time you finish that interviewing process is you want to change them. Now, what directions do you want to change them and how can they change? Let's talk about that, bring that to the forefront of our mind. So when you look at the goals, could the goal be higher? I'd love to hire a marketing person to get me 10 leads a day. I think that person looks like this and costs me that. Can you, can you get me 1,000 leads a day? 1,000 leads a week, right? So I could, I could elevate how much we can achieve. That's one variable. I, your problems, oh, Andy, you, you got problems you don't even know about. You think that person's going to be able to solve them? No, you have this and this and this and this that need to be solved. Somebody who's two years out of school is not going to be able to do that. Somebody who costs $50,000 is not going to be able to do that because you don't even know all the problems you're going to have. So you can raise the level of difficulty. You can actually do the solution. The solution could be more solid, right? Uh, longer lasting. You could do it faster. You could do it cheaper, right? If you're, if I have to pay you more, but you could do it cheaper and a lot more, and that offsets the cost, wouldn't I do that, right? Isn't the ROI there? So goals could be higher. Problems could be more plentiful. The solutions could be faster and cheaper. You also, from a personnel perspective, the profile might be a higher level pers person. Whoa, profile could be a lower level person. You might not need somebody with all those skills to actually solve that problem, depending on other variables. Or the cost, the cost of the person. Well, if I was inaccurate on the profile of the person and I was able to get more, would I not raise my rate? Oh, wait, I was accurate on the goal. I was accurate on the solution. I even had a dead bullseye on the profile. But my estimation of what the market was was causing me to pay the person was inaccurate? Remember something, hiring an individual to work at your organization on the day that individual starts, it's like a stock. 
you have to pay what you have to pay at that moment in time to get that particular person. It goes up and down. It's not a straight line. It's not a flat line. Something that somebody other another company paid six months ago is not the same rate you're going to need to pay today. It changes on a daily basis. Okay, so all five of these things are levers, and you could actually pull the levers, push them up, pull them down, whatever expression you want to use. But this is what's at play, and this is what you need to be thinking about when you go into the interviewing processes. Okay, so there's five things at play. Who's tracking with me so far? Who looks at things this way? Because this is how you get paid more by tinkering with these five areas. And let's talk about how you how you do that. Now, the first thing is when it comes to goals, when you think about your goals and the problems, you want to know going in what the goals of the organization are and what the likely problems are that they encounter. Now, that in and of itself is about a half an hour discussion as to how I would ascertain that. However, I do want you to know this. Based on a job description, you are very unlikely to know what the goals are, meaning it might say, we want you to implement this system. That's a solution. That's not a goal, right? That's a responsibility and something that you need to implement. We want you to grow the sales team. So what? Now, if they start to say something like, and you will raise $10 million this upcoming year, that's a goal. But very few job descriptions actually have that. So there's some, there's some investigation that you're going to need to do to figure out the goals. There's some know-how you're going to have from your experience. And then the problems that organizations have in achieving those goals, you're going to have to dig into your experience bank to think about what those problems are. Now, I have this video. I went... To the trouble of writing out the video because I want you to make sure that you look at this video because this particular video, the job interview tactic that gets you hired, I released this not too long ago, I go into detail about how to evaluate the goals and the problems of the, in, of the, of the individual organizations that you're interviewing with. Because while we all have similar goals, we all have different problems, meaning I might have a marketing goal the marketing goal in my organization is no different than the marketing goal of Coca-Cola. There is no difference, except the problems I have in achieving visibility to get people to find me, to get them to engage with me, and so on. I might have individual challenges that are specific to me. You need to figure out what the goals are and what the individual or unique problems are for that particular organization. My problem might be I don't have enough budget to hire somebody to do it. My problem might be I have enough budget to hire somebody to do it, but this skill set is very rare, so we don't actually know how to run these kind of ads. We don't know how to optimize the search engine. We don't know certain things. Well, you might have already solved that problem through your experience. So I want you to check this out because I want you to understand how you can ascertain that information. Now I want to go to how do you raise your pay? There's five things I want to cover today on how to raise your pay. They fall under the solution aspect, what you're going to change, as well as how you portray your unique value. I'm going to give you the fastest way to portray your unique value. So I got four on the solutions and one on your unique value. So I want to, I want to hit those here uh, real quick. All right, are you enjoying this so far? If you are, click the like button, please. YouTube loves that stuff. Not to mention I do too. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the solutions. Now, you think about the goals and you think about the problems, whatever their goal is, right? If you're going to uh, go to work as the vice president of sales of a software as a services company that implements customer relationship management solutions, their goal is could be to raise revenue. That would make sense. Their goal could be to raise revenue in a new industry line. Maybe we've worked in telecommunications and financial services and we want to branch out into healthcare. Their goal could be we want to sell more revenue, but we want to do it internationally. We don't have any international customers. We'd like to branch into Europe or the UK or, or, or somewhere regional, regional in Europe. Now, you got to figure out what those goals are, and that will surface in the, in the interviewing process. They're going to have challenges in how to do that. They may or may not know how to do that. The, 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 the way to get paid more is for you to be the bullseye. So 
I have actually solved those specific goals and overcome those particular problems. So number one is how close to the mark are you? The closer you are, the more I'm going to pay. Why? Number one, I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable. But number two, I get this person ready, made, walks in on the job, day one, has exactly what I need. I don't have to spend one penny training that person. I don't have to spend one calendar month just having them assimilate to what the hell it is we're doing, right? There's no ramp up time. I'm willing to pay more for that. So the closer you are to the bullseye, now how do you do that? Well, in the stories that you tell about your past, you will have solved that problem. So there was this time when I was the vice president at this particular software as a services company. We sold CRM solutions and I needed to open up branches here, there, other places. I did it in Europe. I did it in Asia Pack. I did it in whatever, right? So the closer you are to what they need, the more they're going to pay you. You might think this is obvious, but you should be obsessing over getting the exactness of your stories to match what they need. And the second thing is, the more exact the solution is in their environment, the more they're going to pay. So just because you did it there, now you need to translate that to me. And the more that sounds like what exactly I need in my environment, I'm going to pay more. So it's the past and the future. So how, Andy, how would you do that? How would you set up and expand this uh, sales team to open up a market in, right? So, so, so number one is more uh, be ex exactly what they need, kind of the the, the bullseye. So cl close to what they need. Second thing is the degree to which the solution can be handled, right? The height of the goal. I think I used the one about you know, can you get me ten leads a day? I'm a marketing person. I need a marketing person. How how much uh, from a lead gen could they actually accomplish? How quickly could they do it? How inexpensively could they do it? So now I want to I want to give you a little example here. I, I think I've talked about this one a time or two, but I like this one because I think it's easy for you and and me to relate on this and for you to understand the variability in hiring. So. Let's say sake of argument that I need a marketing person. I always need a marketing person. Every company needs a marketing person all the time. No matter what they have, they always need more because you're always looking to generate more leads and sell more in revenue. You want more customers. Now, I might think that all I need is somebody to fresh out of school or maybe a couple years as a professional could come and help me uh, put some ads or run some social media posts because everything that I do that's that's going to help me gain visibility is going to be done in a digital uh, manner. It's going to be done from a content marketing perspective because people buy what's in front of them online and they discover what's in front of them online. So I so now to do that, uh, we have various vehicles and media, uh, formats that we use to communicate with the outside world and attract people to understand who I am and what the Mile Walk Academy is all about. And we have videos and we have we have still shots and quote cards and swipes and articles and uh, webinars and other things that we build. And when I look at the function of marketing, I could say I need somebody to help me do one of these functions. Or function satiation says I have well I got videos. And I shoot a, a, a reel each week that I do in a live format, and that could be cut up into 10 or 20 videos. So there's the editing of the videos, there's the cutting of the videos, there's the formatting of the videos, there could be captions. Well, if I'm going to distribute the video, I need somebody to write social media copy. Is that another function? So do I have a videographer, and do I have a social media writer or content writer? I have somebody that needs to evaluate if we are going to market uh, this information and pay uh, for our advertising, well, there's putting it together, there's putting the right copy together, there's circulating it and choosing uh, the right platforms, the frequency, the evaluating of the psychographics and the demographics of the individuals in the geographical locations, there's a lot of data analysis. Is that is that some, could somebody who's who's brand new figure that out, or do I need somebody with expertise who knows how to do that within a couple of weeks so that I'm not overspending to figure that out? 
then what? I have to have somebody who understands the business, that what we do, what we teach, how what we've created maps to that, and so on and so forth. There's 20 different things that I actually need handled. Is that a person? Is it a person and some systems? Is it a particular type of person that already has the experience and understands how to evaluate demographics and psychographics and costs per click and all this other stuff that goes along with it? And so the degree to which something can be handled, the degree to which something can be handled is going to make the pay gyrate. So I'd be happy to pay a lot more money for somebody who could do this faster or who has more of these skills in their repertoire or understands the most valuable aspect that I need where I have no coverage in my company. You don't know any of that. You don't know what goes on behind the scenes until you get in here and I show you. But how are you going to articulate what you can and can't do from a marketing perspective to, to shape the way I want to hire you, the responsibilities that I give you, and how much I'm willing to pay for that? And just because you see a job description and somebody looks like it's well thought out, believe me, most of those are not well thought out. Most of them are highly malleable. I've done no, it, it's, it's Thursday. I've done 14 coaching sessions this week. Half of them were for senior people who had well-written job descriptions, none of whom are taking that particular job because of how it's changing through the interviewing process. So believe me, this is a reality. Yes, I get some companies are cheap and I get some companies are structured and I get some companies don't have any creativity, but most commercial organizations, and I would say to the tune of 90%, and I'm not pulling that number out of my butt. I'm saying I thought back to the 200 or so organizations that we've recruited for, most of the time, most of them were highly flexible in how they would hire because they wanted to get the right people in the organization and assemble the right kind of responsibilities because there's many ways to skin this. So the degree to which the solution can be handled is probably, probably the most significant thing that can change it, your pay. The other thing is, their costs to solve. So think about this. Can you introduce a level of difficulty that they didn't even realize? Andy, it's not so simple. You don't just shoot it, you know, you got that pretty face of yours and your colorful t-shirts and you put up a banner and you roll out an ad. It's, it's more difficult than that. And you could even write golden copy. Andy, you could do that really well. But you know how hard it is to tune the ad to make sure that you're not overspending and that, yes, I could get you more eyeballs on you or more people to follow you. But do you know how difficult it is to get the right kind of people who follow you, who actually invest in your premium programs? Do you know what that takes? I really don't. Explain it to me, right? It's maybe more difficult than I thought. I don't know. Maybe I thought you just run an ad and everything works. I had this one woman that I coached who was interviewing uh, with an organization that was well on its way. I wouldn't even call them a startup anymore. And they were looking to amp up their game and hire a more experienced um, salesperson. They wanted this person to be the chief revenue officer. She'd never been a chief revenue officer, but she was a very senior salesperson and built units and certainly had the pedigree, the the, the experience, and, and could, could do this job. And I was prepping her for one of those sessions. Now, they wanted her to build out the sales team. They were going to be selling this enterprise platform. It was a software as a service. The solution itself is not really all that germane to the story. And we were prepping how she was going to tell them how to build out this sales team and how to expand. Basically, what was the strategy for the sales team to expand and sell this service globally? And it was it, they actually had a fairly large number of customers already, but they really had a lot of people who were working on this stuff and had access to it because it was an open source type of platform that was going to be changing to a paid platform. And... I said, when, and she'd never done this before. And I said to her, when, when, when you're taking them through the steps, before you get to the third step, you need to introduce a bunch of problems that they likely didn't anticipate. And you need to tell them what the problems are, how long it's going to take them, why they're going to need to do them, how it's going to position them, and all these other things. So she starts telling her story. And then she says, okay, now normally what we would do is we would just go to the third step, except for you, because of the transformation that you have to take with the individuals who are already using your platform for free, you're going to need to convince these people 
how this platform is going to benefit them and why they need to pay. And in order to do that, you need to do these four things. And this is the most efficient way to go through a re-education process to get customers who are you know, either paying low to pay more or not paying anything to pay some. And so she goes through this, introduces all this, takes the turn that we talked about her taking, explains, here's what you're going to have to do. Here's how I would recommend doing it. Here's why I think so. And never not one time did she say I'd done this before because she hadn't. She hadn't even done the job before, let alone this this specific problem. She came out and she said, Andy, you would have thought that they thought I hung the moon when I got to that step that you told me to introduce all those problems and tell them how I was going to do it and the rationale. And they never even asked me if I did it before, but they their eyes lit up. I think I had them right there. That's right. That's what I call an experience substitute when you actually explain and, and you can foresee an issue and how you would handle it. And even if you haven't had it, had it before, if your explanation is plausible, you're going to get the same credit. So when you do things, when you're telling your stories, you need to introduce how difficult what they're doing actually is. But you need them to feel relaxed that you already know that. You've anticipated those problems. You know they're going to encounter them and you know how to solve them. That is something I'm worth paying more for. Why? You got the experience, you got the know-how, or you're going to be able to figure it out, and it's going to make me sleep better at night, right? So my risk goes down versus hiring somebody who's in way over their head, right? Another big one. It's harder than you know, especially if they've never done it before. And then the next thing that will hit and I don't want to go through this too much because I have, I don't know, a thousand videos on my YouTube channel. Well, not really a thousand, but you know what I mean? The way you tell your stories. So you're, you're, you're raising the goal, right? You're improving the solution itself. You're doing it faster, cheaper, or whatever. You've raised the level of difficulty, which you know how to handle. But the way in which you articulate all this, so this is kind of a wrapper, is the way you tell your stories. And what do you hear me say often? People pay more for systems than they pay for individual solutions. When you tell your story, my favorite technique, the Andy technique, it's not just the car method because it's not just C-A-R, it's C-A-A-R, so it's A squared. So there's some context of why what you did was important. There's an approach. The first sweep through is an outline of the steps you're going to take. The second sweep through of the approach is filling in the meat on the bones of what you did or what you will do. And the, and the fourth thing is the result, which you foreshadow in the context. I'm not going to go into this whole thing, but the thing I do want to say about storytelling is it's important that you are giving them a map. So this woman I was talking about with the, with the, sale, with the building out the sales team, she says, well, there's seven steps you need to go through, right? We need to make sure that the strategy's in order, but let's take call that step zero. And then there's customer segmentation, and then there's this and this and this and this, and then testing and pilots and so on and hiring. Right, and she takes them through the outline. That's the approach. Now I have a map. And what, what that looks like and sounds like is, oh, she knows the steps. She's got the formula. She's got the playbook. She's got the methodology. She's got the protocols, whatever you want to call it. Because people like end-to-end -end systems. When I talk to you about your job search, a lot of you think you have resume problems. Your resume is the least of your issues. Right? There's and, and somebody, some coach is going to charge you to write your resume. That is a point solution. Number one, you might be circulating it to the wrong places. Even if you circulate it to the right place when you get in there, you're going to have storytelling issues, marketing of you issues. You're going to have a whole host of things. So when I say, hey, I got a coaching program, it helps you make sure you're going in the right direction. It helps you make sure that you market yourself for where you want to go. It helps you with your resume. It helps you with your cover letters. It helps you with LinkedIn. It helps you bring yourself to market using seven different formulas and techniques. It helps you tell your stories. It helps you negotiate better. That's a whole system. People are going to pay more for that. So when you're describing how you do what you do, everything you've ever done in your life needs to be reverse engineered so that when you're telling the story, you're telling the engineered version of the story. It doesn't take you longer. It's faster. And it's really helpful for the listener because they have the map. They know the outline. They know where you are in your story. It's easier for them to remember the fact that you came with a playbook, you were organized, you know what you were doing. That's all you need them to be thinking. You don't need them to be remembering what you're telling them. You're sending feelings. 
okay? So, so the storytelling will raise because the way in which you sound, this is not only easier for them to follow, it makes them feel as though you have a playbook and a methodology, but it also elevates your executive communication. And then the fourth thing I want, or the fifth thing I want to talk about to round this out is your unique value. So the more I get from you, in you, ready-made, walk in the door, get from you, the more I'm willing to pay. So what do I mean? Well, there's a lot of people that have a lot of experience that the employer's interviewing. The more layers you have to you, the more layers, okay, the more they compound, the more exponential you become unique. So let me use me for example, and then we'll talk about you. So I'm a career coach. There's absolutely nothing unique or sexy about that. Nothing. There's a, but I don't know, there's a zillion of them. And I have an online training program, so too do a whole bunch of others, right? I have a YouTube channel, so too do a bunch of others, and a blog. I've even written three books, Fourth to Come. There's other people that have written books, right? So, so that doesn't really make me unique. It really isn't. So we, we haven't even started yet. But when I say, but I was a corporate practitioner for almost two decades. And I worked with a lot of companies. I hired a lot of people. I understand what it takes to be a leader. I understand what it takes to do your job. Most of you, most of you, or I at least can totally speak the same language, even if I don't know exactly what you do day in and day out. And then as a recruiter, I helped another couple hundred com companies and I saw what employers went for. And I prepped person after person to get job after job and understand the fact that everything I'm telling you is something I witnessed. I just had to figure out how to articulate it to you. Okay, well, that makes me more unique. And then when I say, oh, and then I've been coaching for a while and I've got people in nearly 200 countries. And that says global. It says seen a lot. It says understands a lot of different cultures. It, has, it can adapt to my particular situation. Has probably solved the problems that I have specifically that he's done for other people and so on. And every time I add a layer, that makes it harder and harder for you to find anybody that looks like me. Now, I'm not, I may not be everybody's best for everybody, but the point is, I'm adding layer after layer. Wait, and then throw in things like, and I show up every week for you, and I'm always there for you, right? So, so kind of thing. And so every time you're adding something, that makes you more unique. So if you say, well, I'm an IT project manager. Great, I could, I could walk down the street and bump into seven of those. And, you know, and I know how to implement customer experience solutions. Awesome. Now the seven of them might be down to five. And I could do it for healthcare companies. Great. Well, there's a lot of kinds of those. But I could do it for hospitals. Okay, now we're getting now we're getting somewhere. And I've done it for, and I've seen this, and I've done that. And each time you add a layer to you, where do those layers come from? Experience in solution lines, industry lines or sectors, company types, right? Or what the solution is that you solve within the business functions of the company or the solution, or whether you understand how a startup works. And you've worked for different startups with different products, all basically in the IT space, right? Every time you add a layer, you're getting yourself more unique because what that does is it shrinks the candidate pool and it shrinks the likelihood that they could find somebody like you. And the other thing that you have going for you is you have to remember when you add all these layers to you and you're interviewing, not only does it make you more unique, but even if somebody looks just like you, what are the odds that they're interviewing with that company at that time? So this is really, really important. So I just wanna, I wanna make sure that we, we recap this very quickly so that you understand the variability in salary. They have goals and problems. They have estimated solutions to how they want it to handle. These are responsibilities. This is a picture of the person. 10 years of this, seven years of that, two years of this, or whatever, right? Your job, your job profile or responsibility profile or the requirements that they have. And then they have what they think it costs to achieve the solution to the level that they want it to achieve. You get to muck with all of those by focusing on whether you are a direct bullseye I have done that exact thing, or as exact as you can. I could do it better, stronger, faster. I, uh, you know what? It's harder than you think. 
I'll, and you sh I'll show you. I tell better stories. And you know I'm just one of a kind. Right? Okay. So that's, that's that. So expected salary. Don't pay too much attention. All right. If you enjoyed that, click the like button. Make sure you subscribe to the station. If you're watching this on the recording, I will see you next week. If you're here with me live, go on to the chat.